hello to everyone watching. My hope with all our studying is not only for those who are married to have better marriages, but also for those who are not married to think twice about their intended spouse, to look back at everything that we will read and have read, and really consider and compare that person to what God expects, and also to honestly judge ourselves whether we are married or not. Are we what God wants us to be? If I'm not what God wants me to be, should I even form a home, an Adventist home? May you be blessed as we continue our studying, and may you find something relevant for you as we read together. How would I summarize this chapter? How would I summarize this chapter? Now that you've chosen the object of your affection, now what? How do we behave? I don't know how much guidance you would have had as a child, as a teen, as a youth. My guidance, I had no guidance. I can remember on one hand the things I was told by my parents. I'm thinking guidance from your own parents because parents are meant to be our first teachers that they were the main teachers, especially in the Jewish economy where the parents were everything, unless your youth went to the school of the prophets. So, and then we changed, moved on, moved on, and then the Adventist church started making Christian colleges and then some high schools. But the, for the main part, parents were the teachers. So what did I ever hear from my mom? I got, marry anybody as long as he's Adventist, don't be picky whether you're attracted to him or not. Second was, no, I don't want you flirting with that boy. I don't want him hanging around. He's from a bad family. I don't know what the bad family, what, what is wrong with the family. There are unfortunately many people who come from bad families. So mm, third, after that there was nothing until my husband got in touch formally a letter from his family asking if they can come and discuss marriage negotiations. That was, the, that was it. Otherwise, she knew he was phoning me. She knew I would see him on weekends. She bought him food. She knew we were dating. But he never told her formally. I never told her formally. We didn't have that relationship. So she knew, I'm buying food for you and I'm buying food for your future husband. Now, when the letter came, she said, but aren't you going to marry so-and-so from church? And I said, huh? <laughs> I mean, I'm dating with this one. Why would I marry someone else from church? Where would they even get that idea from? So she said, yeah, but at church during lunch, his mother constantly said that you two are getting married. He just needs to finish his varsity because he was maybe two, three years older than me. And then he's waiting for you to finish varsity and then you'll get married. That's what she said. So I told her, he never said so. I don't like him. I don't like her even. I like her even less than I like him. So no, I'm not marrying him. And then she asked, do you love him, my future husband? And I said yes. And that was the sum total of our discussion as mother-daughter on boyfriends, marriage, all of it. That was it. That was it. On the other hand, with my children, I'm sure they're tired. <laughs> they're tired. They must be tired of it because it comes up in many of the books we study. There's someone who's always marrying the wrong person. There are principles that always can guide how you marry, who you marry, and what kind of person you should be when you get married. So, yeah, they have heard it a lot. But just in case, I also bought them some books that cover marriage or courtship. And one of them deals specifically with you being right before you look for someone else. It's about you. And that is the theme of our Adventist home. Well, that's the theme I want to push forward. It's about us. Are we the right person? Are we doing the right thing? Are we surrendered to Christ before we trap someone or link someone to our lives, to ourselves?
So yes, when we do talk about what the other should do, please let's also bear in mind that we are someone else's other. The high, this is from 55.1. The high, noble, lofty design of God, of God in the institution of marriage is not discerned. Therefore, the purest affections of the heart, the noblest traits of character are not developed. Ask seriously, how many people when they're dating or courting, okay, dating, are thinking, what is God's design for us as a couple? We don't think that. We honestly don't. We just think about what we would like, what the other person likes. And therefore, because we aren't looking at God's design for marriage, we then don't reach God's standards for marriage. And we don't call out the purest affections. I never sat there thinking, I want my boyfriend's purest affections. I just want him to love me. That's what I want. I want him to show he loves me. And sometimes what the world has put in our heads that shows he loves you isn't what God knows is the true sign of his true and purest affection. And of course, noblest traits of character. Are we really thinking about this person and nobility? Are we really thinking about integrity, character, giving, humility, justice, judgment, the orphan and the widow? Not really. For me, those came later. I didn't assess him based on those things. I really didn't. Neither did my friend, I know, one friend I know. In fact, none of my people ever, ever assessed their future boyfriend or boyfriend according to those noble traits and according to the character that they should be developing for God. It's always ever been about what can I get from them for me? So we need that paradigm shift. We need to, t we need to teach our children to also have that shift in what they are looking for in a person. Also, just a thought, sometimes, um, we are the problem. There was a girl who went out for a first date with the man and he happened to know my husband from previous interaction. So I kind of knew him online. He, was not, he wasn't in our city. And I knew the girl because I'd seen her once physically and then we continued a WhatsApp conversation. She went out with him. She was upset with the way he was dressed because he dressed poor. One red flag already. And she didn't like the fact that when he was, when we were out in the garden, he kept talking about God. Look at the majesty of God and what he has done. She was saying, but he should have been telling me I'm beautiful. Now that I think of it, especially for a first ever date or courtship meeting appointment, I don't know that that is really what God wants. And also, did you ever realize or think that he was also nervous? What if he was thinking she wants a godly man, let me be godly? Some of these things we need to discuss and ask each other. Okay, when you were talking all about God and everything, why did you do that? And if you're trying to pursue me, what are your thoughts about me? Where do you see us going? Conversation, it could have helped, communication. But she wanted to be praised and flattered, and she didn't want a poor man. So they did break up. He married someone else who's just as humble as he is and they're happy. Now, during our courtship, I'm sorry, it's to the side. I forgot to bring my iPad. Not one word should be spoken, not one action performed that you would not be willing the holy angels should look upon and register in the books above. You should have an eye single to the glory of God. Whew! Not one word, not one action that you don't want the angels to witness. <sighs> this one I failed on. And I know most couples, even most Christian of couples, have failed on this. Not by, not planning to fail, but emotion, lust took over and then they failed. There's a young couple, I mean, they're not really perfectly happily married at the moment. But except for one sign where I thought, mm -mm, 
and I did send some evidence. They seemed perfectly suited because they both loved the same things. They both loved to go out in nature. They both loved to do mission work. They both wanted a large family and they both wanted to adopt. They haven't done any of those things at the moment. And it's been a while of marriage. It's been some years. It's been actually eight years and they haven't done any of that. But that's beside the point. The thing is, they were sure and careful to please and honor the angels and God. They took it to steps that most people would think is crazy. It's too extreme, but it was right. If she came to visit him, he made sure that there was a third party. If the third party wasn't able to be there, they would leave the door open so that nothing can ever happen between the two of them that shouldn't happen. They lived in a, he lived in a flat, so people were always walking past you know, other people in, a, in an apartment block complex, whatever you call it, wherever you are. So they never ever were alone in secret or in private behind locked doors. Never ever. If they were together, just the two of them, they were out in public together, either doing some hospital visits together, going up hiking together. So they got to know each other. They got to know each other's hearts but in a way that God would not want to close his eyes and think, what are they doing? They purposed in their hearts, we will never fornicate. We don't even want to kiss. The first kiss we share must be the kiss at the altar when the pastor says, you may now kiss the bride. That is rare, so rare that the man's older brother who lived an opposite life praised it abundantly during their wedding reception. So it's achievable. You can do it. You can stay hands off, but still be deeply in love with your intended spouse. It's possible and it's holy. It, it's holy. This business of it will come later, so I'll stop there. When one commandment of the Decalogue is broken, the downward steps are almost certain. When once the barriers of female modesty are removed, the basest, the basest licentiousness does not appear exceeding sinful. Okay, let me just stop there. I, 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 I'll highlight it a bit more. This was the story of Samson. He broke one law, and look where he ended up. He would have never dreamed that Marrying the wrong person would lead to his premature death, blindness first, being a, a mocking, I'm sorry, a mocking bird, being someone to be mocked, played with, toyed with, imprisoned. That's not what he thought would happen. He didn't realize that one mistake led to a series of terrible, terrible consequences. When once the bassist when once, when once the barriers of female modesty are removed, then the basest licentiousness does not appear exceeding sinful. God is a holy God. He prizes modesty. The body is meant to be seen by the woman's husband, only her husband, the way he clothed both genders. You couldn't see even the outline of their bodies. Some people will wear long items, but they're so figure-hugging that you might as well be naked. You might as well be wearing a miniskirt. But that's not what God wanted. Modesty is important to God. As soon as the woman wears a shorter miniskirt, or if she t takes off her clothing, other things will follow that are not pure. God tells us to flee youthful lusts. Don't fornicate. Don't have sex with someone who's not your husband. God says so. So, but if we start going, you know, we start being alone, we start not caring, we start thinking about the other more than we're thinking about God, when we start horm letting hormones take over thought and principle, the next thing will be something else. And then we'll kid ourselves and say, ah, it's not that sinful. 
we love each other after all or it was only once or well there was a couple who got married no there was a couple who fell pregnant who conceived before they got married and this is a woman I didn't know him but she was extremely sure no intercourse before marriage but they didn't actually have intercourse you see they got naked they, they were in bed they were fooling around no sex but he, they were both naked they fooled around and sperm can swim sperm can swim and she still fell pregnant that was not God's design moments of vulnerability can lead to a downfall hugging even hugging is dangerous if you want to avoid God's if you want to avoid a downward step because when you're alone and hugging each other it can lead to kissing each other and then something else will happen which if you are truly holy afterwards you will feel terrible that it happened so my message to you is if you are engaging in sex before marriage pray with your partner your boyfriend girlfriend and ask that you stop and that from now on you will honor God it will be difficult but if you put in place the steps that other couple did it will be possible God can always change you you're not the fornicator you were last night alas what terrible results of women's influence for evil may be witnessed in the world today through the allurements of strange women thousands are incarcerated in prison cells prostitutes killing prostitutes and back then prostitution was was illegal so you were literally put in prison cells many take their own lives there's a man even now in our cohort who had had a full-on relationship with his girlfriend and then she dumped him for him well they were like they married they were fornicating and he couldn't take the fact that she left him he had built a future with her when he was living much of it and he did commit suicide i'm sure a few of us can think of people who committed suicide over a woman or if she chooses to marry someone else when you thought you were ready you commit suicide it's too common and many cut short the lives of others wow haven't we heard even today of adulterous wives whose lovers plan together with the adulterous wife to kill the husband we have court cases trials going on here in our country i'm sure it happens in every country we the innocent spouse is killed and another way to cut short a life is when there's intimacy happening you catch a disease a deadly disease and you pass it on to the other they don't know you haven't told them they don't take any medication ARVs etc and they die there are many ways to cut short someone's life led by a strange woman an evil woman a seductress how true the words of inspiration as the proverb said her feet go down to death her steps take hold on hell next one is 59.4 an hour of thoughtlessness once yielding to temptation may turn the whole current of your life in the wrong direction you can have but one youth make that useful when once you have passed over the ground you can never return to rectify your mistakes I know a friend of mine who she was going to be a virgin until the day she got married. The man, the boyfriend told her, "Please, like, don't be such a granny. There's nothing wrong with kissing." And it went all the way down to intercourse. When they broke up, she decided, "That's it. I'm stuck. I've already slept with one person. We are one. I'm um, I'll never may have someone else she forgot that the god of the bible forgives you you become pure you're not the mistakes of your past you become pure she wasn't married to him 
so she could have and should have stayed away and moved on to someone else who was purer but she didn't instead she went back to him and she trapped herself in a whole cycle i will come back to that too you can have but one youth you only have one virginity once it's taken and gone it's gone even if you are now tomorrow going to be celibate it will have been too late so if you haven't done it don't do it don't get close physically just one moment of thoughtlessness one moment of thoughtlessness can lead to a, a life that you yourself regret there are people who also they 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 get intimate they're not really even in love yet they don't even know each other but then they make a baby and there's parental pressure you've made her pregnant marry her but then they don't actually even know each other and once they get married they realize they don't love each other what happens a life of misery or because they conceived the rest of the paragraph which is 59.4 he who refuses to connect with god and puts himself in the way of temptation will surely fall many have excused their carelessness and irreverence because of the wrong example given them by more experienced professors but this should not deter any from right doing in the day of final accounts you will plead no such excuse as you plead now the excuses we make we would we will not make them to god right now god has sent humans to warn us to try and help us and we give off silly we give them silly excuses silly answers it's not linked to marriage but someone will say well i can't be modest because no one else is modest all the other girls stop being modest so it shows that it's not possible which i think is the dumbest thing ever because if they were modest then it is possible that excuse will not wash with god you are responsible for your own salvation not others think about what god wants for you in your life and in your marriage just because others are dating not courting doesn't mean you have to date god knows and he's given you the knowledge for you to also know the right path follow it uh, 58.2 this is going in crazy order as i said i forgot my laptop and i study on my phone so uh, all the quotes are on my phone and then when i sent them sorry i study on my i left my ipad and that is it has my sop the, the what's it called the app on there so they link when i'm studying on my phone all my highlights go to my ipad automatically i forgot my ipad and so now i'm using my laptop i took screenshots the screenshots are were in order but they arrived higgledy piggledy so i'm sorry for the jumping back and forth that i'm doing please forgive me so i said that's 59.2 right it's check 58.2 professed christians whose lives are marked with integrity and who seem sensible upon every other subject make fearful mistakes here they may manifest a set determined will that reason cannot change they become so fascinated with human feelings and impulses that they have no desire to search the bible and come into close relationship with god how true that is and i've seen in too many lives how that has changed someone beyond recognition a man who would take the correct steps the first time ask is this the right woman for me come please let's have a, a double date i don't want to be alone with her the next minute he's fascinated by a woman who is honestly a strange woman she might be in the church but she's not holy and pure like the woman he claimed he wanted to marry and like the man he seemed to be and he goes with her and he forgets all the principles he claimed to espouse from the bible and that leads to children who are not at all raised like the way 
in the way he said he would raise his children before he met the, the seductress, as I will call her. <sighs> wow, I think this was actually the last paragraph, but I'll read it anyway. Thou shalt not steal was written by the finger of God upon the tables of stone. Yet how many underhand stealing of affections is practiced and excused? A deceptive courtship is maintained. Private communications are kept up until the affections of one who is inexperienced and knows not where unto these things may grow are in a measure withdrawn from her parents and placed upon him who shows by the very course he pursues that he is unworthy of her love. The Bible condemns every species of dishonesty. I think this one was linked to the paragraph that talks about how a man must first get the permission of the girl's parents before he courts her. But we don't do that in general. People don't do that. And when you've caught especially a young girl, that's how grooming happens. They catch young girls, they're old, sophisticated, give them gifts, promise them the world. The girl starts defying her parents' rules, comes back later and later, drinks which she knows she shouldn't do. And the next thing, if he is a criminal, part of a grooming gang, he's taken her and she's being used by many other people, not only him. But in a less extreme sense also, you do have, not all men, most men are evil, because most humans are evil. So the man will find this innocent girl and make her his plaything, insist on doing things that she's not comfortable with, but because she wants to please him, she forgets God, she forgets her parents, and she goes ahead. It goes back to the first point. Everything you do, Ask yourself, do you actually want the angels to be witnessing what you're doing? Don't steal. Any man who takes a woman, takes a woman's affections without her parents knowing, is stealing. Adultery. Any person who flirts with a married person is stealing that person from the one the other is married to. They are one, they belong together, they are part of a family. You are stealing from someone else's Family, you are shameful. To trifle with hearts is a crime of no small magnitude in the sight of a holy God. And yet, some will show preference for young ladies and call out their affections and then go their way and forget all about the words they have spoken and their effect. A new face attracts them and they repeat the same words, devote to another the same attention. And like the above paragraph, this also happens in marriage with adultery. The words the man should be using on his wife, he's now using on some other person out there. Men, men are the players in general. Men are the ones who just play around. Women tend to fall hard in general. And men flirt with this one and then flirt with that one. And the effect is disastrous. You've broken a girl's heart. It is a crime in God's eyes. It is a crime in God's eyes to go around flirting with this one, pretending you love her, and then saying the exact same words of devotion to another and leaving the other one feeling hurt. This disposition will reveal itself in the married life. The marriage relation does not always make the fickle mind firm, the wavering, steadfast, and true to principles. That was 57 and 57.1 and 57.2. I have seen that. If someone is a constant flirt, a constant liar before marriage, they tend to remain the same after marriage. It's a principle, it's a process we discussed last week for chapter 6. So I won't go deep into it, we know. Okay, this was the one. 
A young man who enjoys the society and wins the friendship of a young lady, unbeknown to her parents, does not, does not act a noble Christian part toward her or toward her parents. Through secret communications and meetings, he may gain an influence over her mind, but in so doing, he fails to manifest that nobility and integrity of soul which every child of God will possess. In order to accomplish their ends, they act a part that is not frank and open and according to the Bible standard and prove themselves untrue to those who love them and try to be faithful guardians over them. It is so normal to do that, but it is in God's eyes so evil. There was a young man who wanted to do things right and he was so insistent on doing things right that he traveled with us because <laughs> we knew him, we knew his character he was from our church. That we traveled with him to the province where the girl lived and he stated, I mean the parents were confused because they don't know this. The girlfriend told them, the, yeah, the girlfriend to be told them, mom and dad, this and this is going to happen on this weekend, is, are you free? Well, words to that effect, because someone wants to come and ask you something. The only thing we Africans especially think of, or anyone actually, or parents, you'll think marriage, because that's what we know. But no, he wanted to ask them if he can be in a relationship with their daughter. He didn't want to just do it over the phone. He wanted them to see his face, his bearing, and he wanted us to testify as neutral parties. And it's not like he's our brother. We were neutral. We knew him. Like we knew everybody else in our church. We knew the weak, we knew the strong, we knew the sinners, we knew the ones who were trying to overcome. So we knew him. And so he went with us and we were older than him. Though of course we look young, so maybe they figured we were all so young. It's not like we explained to them how old we were. And yeah, so we went to them. And that also gave the mother a chance to ask, what about my daughter's interest in mission work? Will you stop her from doing it, from pursuing it? What if you get married? What are your plans then? What? That's the beauty. The parents then also get to know you. They get to ask you questions. They also get to form their own opinion. They get to know you properly. But if you've stolen their daughter, they want to know if there are any red flags. They will know that maybe in all other respects, you are actually a good man. You just happen to steal their daughter because maybe you just don't know that you should ask the parents first if you can court, date their daughter. It's old, old fashioned, it's unusual, it's the right thing to do. Much of God's will is, interestingly enough, old fashioned because God is the ancient of days. 55.2, a very strong, strong statement, very scary. And so this is why again I tell you, if you haven't done it, purpose in your heart, you will not do it. Don't even hug him. Don't hold her close if you're not married to her. No matter how much you love each other, no matter how long you've been together. Not one word should be spoken, not one action performed that you would not be willing the holy angels should look upon and register in the books above. You should have an eye single to the glory of God. The heart should have only pure sanctified affection worthy of the followers of Jesus Christ, exalted in its nature, your heart, and more heavenly than earthly. Anything different from this, pure sanctified affection, exalted, heavenly, more than her earthly, anything different from this is debasing, degrading in courtship. This is when you do things that God would you would not want God to write about in heaven. Things you wouldn't do in front of anybody else. That is degrading in courtship and marriage cannot be holy and honorable in the sight of a pure and holy God unless it is after the exalted scriptural principle. That is scary that some of us are willingly going into unholy marriages. A marriage God doesn't view as honorable. 
all because we slipped up. Then we're basically on our own. Especially is this a crime on those who prey on the innocent, on the vulnerable. And this is also why it is very hard to trust someone you didn't grow up with, whose reputation you don't know, whose actions you haven't seen. One of the terrible people I know of, I mean, he was an adulterer all the time, but he met a girl, he had planned to be a virgin. He met a girl, she said she's a virgin, and she made up a reason to be stuck and needing to be in his, he was in varsity, university. She made up a reason to need to be in his room. He was going to be honorable, he was gonna ask her parents for permission to marry her one day. He was gonna do it the right way, but he wasn't a Joseph. We need more Josephs in the female form too. So she made up a pretext, a reason to stay over. Did it once, they were, she slipped, he slipped on the floor, she slipped on his bed. The next time they slipped in the bed together. She seduced him. He had never done any such thing, so he got excited. But he was fumbling. I mean, it's the first time. He doesn't know what to do. But she made it with the actions she performed. It was clear to him. And the fact that she never felt any pain. I'm going to be frank. Intercourse, when it's your first time, is painful. Unless your hymen got damage for other reasons. But intercourse is painful for the first time. She felt nothing. It was only for her enjoyable that first, first time. And she was doing things that you'd have to be really experienced to do. Only later did it come out that she was almost the university bicycle. Everybody had ridden her. Not everybody, but many men had ridden her. She was lying her university bicycle, not his. She had been lying about being a virgin and she had planned it so that she's got him. He was too honorable to dump her when he had now slept with her. Like the other girl who felt she was now wedded to him because she had become one in flesh, he felt obligated to marry her. That is an unholy marriage. And though he was weak, the greater sin is on the part of the woman who lied and played the seductress. May we please be honorable. Check yourself, check your behavior before marriage and after, and after marriage. What is your behavior like? Is it pleasing to God or are you lying to someone, being underhanded? 56.4, uh, see it's going backwards here. Satan knows just what elements he has to deal with. Satan knows us, he knows humans, he's known humans for longer than we've lived. Thousands of years, 6,000 years, over 6,000 years. Satan knows just what elements he has to deal with. He knows you, he knows you so well. And he displays his infernal wisdom in various devices to trap souls to their ruin. He watches every step that is taken and makes many suggestions. And often these suggestions are followed rather than the counsel of God's word. The truth is Satan hasn't written a manual for us to obey. We see it around us. We see it in the things we watch. We hear it in the lyrics of the songs we listen to. Those are suggestions. But God's counsel is written in black and white, whatever color, red sometimes when it's Jesus' words in some Bibles. But it's written, this finely woven dangerous net is skillfully prepared to entangle the young and unwary. It's the saddest part. The younger you are, the more likely you are to be trapped. You're not aware of what to watch out for. You don't know that people can change from angelic to demonic. You have no clue. It may often be disguised under a covering of light, but those who become its victims pierce themselves through with many sorrows. As the result, we see wrecks of humanity 
everywhere. <sighs> Some are not aware, sometimes want to forgive things that they shouldn't forgive in the sense of forgive and forget instead of forgive but run away. Unaware, innocent, young, he seems godly. Okay, he's done this, he says we should do that. Maybe it's okay after all. I haven't read all my Bible yet. Maybe there is a part that says this is okay. And we pierce ourselves with many sorrows, not just one, many. The impact is felt throughout your life and upon those who you have an impact on. God forbid you have children with someone who is really satanic. Those children are caught in a warring family. Okay, this is from 56.2. I'm going to do the last, the last lines and the first lines and put them together. Satan's angels are keeping watch with those who devote a large share of the night, sorry, to courting. Satan's angels are keeping watch with them who are together at night while courting. As a general thing, marriage ends all the devotion manifested during the days of courtship. Another thing we have discussed before. She says that the hours we spend at night should really be spent together in marriage, not before marriage. The devil is there. The devil is in the night time. The devil is in the details. He's in the room. If you're alone together, he can and will overpower you. So rather stay away from even the appearance of evil so that you don't end up doing evil. Fornicating, fornicating is evil. And yes, marriage then ends those, the very same attention you were given when you were quoting that really should not have been given. Sadly, it ends during marriage. And this is even for those who did begin right. People become too comfortable with their spouses. It's like, well, I know they're here, so why should I make an effort? Or, uh, I know they're here, I love my wife, let me get busy with my work emails. I love my husband, but let me read this. And we forget to show the same devotion to the marriage. Marriage takes work. It's not necessarily hard work, though. It's just work, thought, being intentional. You have now chosen whether it's the right person or the wrong person, and whether your marriage was viewed by God as honorable or holy or not, you are now married. Keep the same devotion, to show the same devotion towards the other that you showed them before marriage. God cares about even that part of your life. Seriously, you, every aspect of your life has an influence and impact on how God views you. And that includes your courtship, what you say, what you do, when you do it. I hope that we will pray and think, think hard, think deep, think long before we court, purpose in our hearts to be pure and find one who has purposed in their heart to also be pure. And if he trifles with your heart once, don't let him trifle with your heart ever again.